Our second scripture reading is from Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. We continue in our study of spiritual fruits and digging in, but um, gee, no, to eat um, and to enjoy and to anchor ourselves in the richness and the goodness um, that is the way of following Christ. And today we talk about goodness, and it's a helpful reminder, at least speaking for myself, of how wide and deep and full God's goodness actually is. To have a goodness, in fact, so mighty that if we saw the fullness of it in the face of God, we would die. There's a little nervousness and anxiety and discomfort that comes in that moment of how could anything good then cause us to die and how can we say then that that is goodness? But if we think of the power of goodness, and we think of the power of evil, then I want my good to be strong enough to be able to combat the forces that I know much better than the strength and the power of good. Especially in a week where three have been shot dead in their workplace, where families have been violently torn apart, I want the power of goodness to have real power, to have real strength, to be able to do something about the evil that we encounter and that we know here and all over the world. I think sometimes, especially in well-developed countries where Um, Although, and this is not to say we don't have struggles, because we do, Um, but in places where we don't typically struggle for survival, we can begin to become a little comfortable and maybe even a little complacent in that comfort that things are set and that we have the ability to be good people and do good things because of the resources that we have, the catch in that is that it can so easily tip over into doing good because of the good of who we are, not because of the good of who God is and in whose image we're created. Do we approach goodness as something we do, as something we give, is something that comes from us, that we are master of? Or do we approach goodness as something that is wild, that is wild throughout all creation, that is way beyond us, because we are creatures ourselves, and because the goodness comes from creator, a goodness that we carry only a tiny piece of, that every single other person and creature and creation carries as well. Do we beg to see God's goodness like Moses? Are we comfortable thinking that we've got goodness taken care of? After all, God gave us the Ten Commandments through Moses just a couple chapters earlier, and that's the basis and the call of our goodness, right? And and we like lists, and we like check boxes that we can say, oh, yep, didn't steal today, I am good, I am set. Didn't do any murder today, I am good, I am set. I am not like the others who did. 
except even on this week, even in a week in which murders have happened. What God asks us to do is to believe that those murderers were created in God's goodness, just like we are. That they too carry a spark of divine goodness, just like we do. And that's something that goes way beyond what we do and what we don't do, and way beyond at least my comprehension. I've been reading this book, Made for Goodness, by Desmond Tutu, um, because of how it calls me to re-envision what I hold as goodness and what a good life looks like. I don't know of anyone else who can call us to goodness and love, who can fully make the claim and fully believe in it that indeed all humanity is made for goodness, that all humanity is inherently good as bearers of the image of the goodness of God. This is someone who knows the real evil that can be present and that can hold sway in the world. And this is one who, having walked through that, is still claiming and still preaching, is still teaching goodness. That's the depth that I want. Because speaking for myself, in coming across that level of evil, heck, not even getting to that point, let's just talk about the beltway. <laughs> I still can't totally hold the goodness even there. I shut down. So what does it mean to cultivate and to grow a spiritual fruit of goodness that will give us power to see beyond the possibility that we put in place? That will help us to widen what we think is possible and make the impossible possible. And that's the discipleship journey. That's walking by faith and not by sight because if I am walking by sight, there is no way that I will be able to ascribe any goodness to the person that killed those three people this week. But yet I'm called to do that as a follower of Christ. There's a risk that is always involved in this kind of discipleship. There is a vulnerability that comes that is unnerving. And we as church sometimes are able to provide space that empowers that vulnerability and that goodness. And other times we do exactly the opposite. I've been in church communities of both and. I've been in what I call behavioral code churches where I have to present a flawless exterior to prove the level and depth of my faith that depends on the way I dress and what I say and what I do and don't do and how I hold myself in worship. I've also been a part of church communities where I am able to come and be honest about where I failed and where I've struggled and where I've been scared. I have a very strong preference <laughs> um, for which type of faith community empowers me the most in my faith journey. I was able just this week and sitting around um, the table with the folks who are going through the small group training to name what I am afraid of and to have conversation about what it might look like here to build a community and give witness to walking in faith in a way that we don't know what the outcome will be. What does it mean for us to be together on this journey even when we have very different ideas of how goodness is defined? and what goodness or holiness looks like lived out. 
And how do we stay in that journey together if we really firmly believe that one or the other is wrong? How do we go forward together? It's a risk that for me is nerve-wracking, but is also the exact place where I find goodness that is beyond me. And where I am grown and expanded more than I could ever think of or imagine. You all have had moments in your life where you've had to walk by faith and not by sight. For Abraham and me, that was coming here because it meant that we had 24 hours to decide whose job we were going to give up um, because we couldn't meet the geographic requirements of both of them at the same time. That was a huge moment for us of risk. And it has made us a lot stronger for it because we have stepped together into an unknown and because it's been beyond what we're comfortable with and okay with managing on our own, we've had to rely on a goodness beyond ourselves. And it's been gorgeous. And that happens for us in terms of presence and where we are just like it happens for us in finances. We share a passage that gives witness to the goodness of the early church and how they came together and shared everything in common. I mentioned that we're meeting together for the stewardship meeting or the budget meeting next week and we'll have our time of stewardship um, and commitment Sunday rolling out here in a few weeks on November 12th. But this is a time where we discern what we are able to give, what we are able to share. Now, we're not as radical as the early church was, and I'm not asking for everybody to give me their mortgages, and we'll put that into a trust here at the church, and we're all going to share and hold it all in common. But I am asking for us to discern what a percentage would be, where we have enough and we can give and stretch ourselves in our giving to ensure that someone else has enough to build something here at Epworth that is beyond what we can build on our own as individuals, to share that, to come together. It's nerve-wracking because each of us on our own carry a ton of financial needs and responsibilities and obligations. Abraham and I know what it is to live on one income, and we only had to do that for a while. There are people in our community that do that as single parents their entire lives long. There is an empathy that those moments of vulnerability create that is nothing short of the goodness of God. An awareness that what we first defined of as enough really is way more than enough. And that when we enter into these times of risk and vulnerability, not only will there be people there, as you all were there for us and others in our community, to give just the right gift at just the right time, but there will also be the chance for us to redefine what actually is enough. Because the way our culture defines that is very different than what Christ's call to discipleship defines that as. And that is the peace where our faith grows. That is the peace where God's goodness calls us beyond what we define as good into a fuller, richer, deeper surprise. Now, I am not going to lie. It is not a pain-free process. It is cranky. There will be fights. It will not be pretty all the time. But it is worth it. Abraham and I have had conversations of how much stronger we are now because of it and how different we approach life together because of it. And if we didn't take that risk, then we would have never given God that space to work in our lives in that way. And as hard as it was, holy crap, it was worth it because it's amazing to see what can come 
what we never even thought could come, what we would never even held possible. And, you know, just for the funny things, it means I would have never been at this church, and that means I would have never been in a meeting where Isaac teaches me that the platypus is actually venomous. And I have to, right? Right? <laughs> yeah. And so there are fun, funny moments like that, but there are also moments then that I would have never been in this space, and I would have never gotten the voicemail from Ms. Ann Rogers that I did telling me about how amazing Bob and Sylvia are, because when a clutch, they went and took her to a doctor's appointment, and she just, they are good, they must have been angels in one life, because I felt like I was with mom and dad, I was a kid, I didn't have to worry about anything, everything was taken care of. Or when I visit Jack and Irma, I wouldn't have had the moment of them telling me how Lois and Randy follow up with them all the time and how much they love them and how much they're grateful for them. I wouldn't have been here to watch and to see all of the moments where we care for each other. And this week of all weeks, I wouldn't have been here and wouldn't have had the experience of a church taking the risk and going with the craziness of not hosting a church conference that we have planned for months and which cookies have been baked for and people are here, but to upend our business as usual, to stand with a community whose lives were just turned upside down, to be at that vigil and to watch everyone come together to watch representative from the business be there and thank people for standing with them to have to know that that business has a chaplain they employ a chaplain whole time to be there for their employees and for that chaplain to then be able to share with us the way they really need our goodness is for cards and emails and packages to come in throughout the coming year as this employment goes through the process of working to feel safe in their office once more, of going through the grieving and the anger and needing reinforcement to remember a different side of humanity than the picture that was put and imprinted on their body, soul, memories this past week. So will we be that church that comes together, that sends cards and love and homemade cookies again not just last week, but in the week to come. Because let me tell you, homemade cookies make a difference because when the vigil has ended and they invited us to the refreshment table and all those cookies you bake for church conference, we took there to the vigil. And I was there opening the bags when a guy came up and looked at them and said, are these homemade? <laughs> and in that moment is a love and a goodness and a rewriting of the evil and the pain that happened. This is our call. It is a call to be vulnerable. It is a call to let the negative attributes of human nature, greed and laziness, rage and jealousy, be unmasked. For we will come to recognize them as fear in disguise. We hoard against the fear that we will not have enough. We overspend because we think more things will silence our dread of having nothing. We are lazy and we procrastinate lest we prove that we are incapable. We think that we can hide behind the fiction that we have not failed if we have not tried. We get enraged rather than admit that we are confused, hurt, worried, inadequate. When we deny our fears or try to run from them, they loom over us larger than life. When we can face our fears, they do not metastasize into something else. When we dare to name our fears, they shrink to a manageable size. If you can name your fear, you may recognize that same fear in others. Then, rather than create division, fear can open our eyes to our common humanity. And that recognition can displace the jealousy that poisons so many relationships. 
We are jealous because we fear that if the other person is loved, applauded, or admired, there will be no love, applause, or admiration left over for us. But there is enough for us. That's why we remember the goodness that overwhelmed Moses, that you couldn't even face fully because of how much there is. There are enough of the material things in the world for us all to flourish. There are enough of the intangible things for all of us to thrive. But for us to engage in the practices that will ensure that we all prosper, we must come to know that each of us is linked in the chain of our common humanity, that God dwells in each of us, and that we care enough to find out what that looks like even when it's uncomfortable because it's so different from what that looks like in our own lives. This is what we're trying to do in the small groups that we're putting together. Set the space for us to be honest and vulnerable with one another in a way that we can love each other, in a way that we can rewrite painful memories and rewrite the way that we're programmed for fear and together remember the goodness of God that is so fully beyond us. I'd like to end with a prayer from Desmond Tutu. If you would take a deep breath, center yourself, get comfortable, and may this be God speaking with the voice of the heart. You are my child, my beloved, With you, I am well pleased. Stand beside me and see yourself. Borrow my eyes so you can see perfectly. When you look with my eyes, then you will see that the wrong you have done and the good left undone, the words you have said that should not have been spoken, the words you should have spoken but left unsaid, the hurts you have caused, the help you've not given, are not the whole story of you. You are not defined by what you did not achieve. Your worth is not determined by success. You were priceless before you drew your first breath, beautiful before dress or artifice, good at the core. And now is time for unveiling the goodness that is hidden behind the fear of failing. You shout down your impulse to kindness in case it is shunned. You suck in your smile, you smother your laughter, you hold back the hand that would help. You crush your indignation when you see people wronged or in pain. In case all you can do is not enough. In case you cannot fix the fault. In case you cannot soothe the searing, in case you cannot make it right. But what does it matter if you do not make it right? What does it matter if your efforts move no mountains? It matters not at all. It only matters that you live the truth of you. It only matters that you push back the veil to let your goodness shine through. It only matters that you live as I have made you. It only matters that you are made for me, made like me, made for goodness.